Hello and welcome to the structural training provided by the City of Santa Clarita. Uh, my name is John Caparelli. I'm an engineer with the City's Building and Safety Division. And uh, today we're going to, in this uh, four-part video, we're going to talk about residential wood frame structures. And we're going to uh, cover some of uh, the, not only the code requirements, but we're going to talk about some of the physics and behavior of structures and some of the details. And we're really going to get in and uh, uh, talk about structural behavior why structures behave the way they do, and uh, kind of give you a little bit of background so when you're applying the building codes, uh, you don't just focus on how but why. All right. Uh, now, every three years, you're probably aware that the state adopts new building codes. And these codes uh, adopted by the state must also, by law, be adopted by the city. Our city building and safety division provides training for our engineers and building inspectors on the new codes. Now, uh, this year, uh, for the first time, we're providing that same in-house training that we provide to our staff in the form of these videos for the public, for our customers. So if you're a designer, an architect, an engineer, uh, a contractor, or even an owner-builder, this video is for you. Uh, we want to give you the same information that we give our staff and make this information available to you. All right. Uh, now, with every new addition of the building code, the structural regulations uh, become more complex. However, the physics of structures will never change. All right? And so the key to understanding uh, the structural codes is understanding structural behavior. When you know why, when you know how a structure works and, 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 and why structures behave the way they do, then understanding and applying the code becomes easy. You know, I, I believe that, you know, uh, an ounce of why is worth a pound of how. And that's what we're going to try to convey in this training today, is get into the physics and get into the why, and then also talk about uh, the, the, uh, the codes and some of the specific provisions and specific details. Okay, uh, today we're going to use a typical two-story house as our example. So we've got an example project uh, of a, of a two-story wood-framed home in Santa Clarita. We are not going to talk today about... Um, complicated uh, structural concepts. Uh, you know, this, this training is really, um, if you're a structural engineer, it's really more review. Uh, but uh, we're not going to get into really complicated structural concepts. We're going to talk about basics and we're going to talk about uh, code requirements, okay? We're also going to take some time today to talk about some of the major changes in the latest code and some of our city's uh, structural amendments. Okay. Uh, one of the concepts that I, that I uh, like to use when talking about structures is a structural load path is like a chain. And I thought this picture kind of illustrates this concept in, in, in a neat way. Uh, a chain is only as strong as its, as its weakest link. And so uh, in this chain, uh, you know, this guy is going to determine how strong the chain is. Um, and so structures behave the same way. Uh, if one structural uh, connection or element is missing, then one link in that chain is gone. And just like, a, just like a, a real chain, if you take a link out, you don't have a load path. You don't have a chain anymore. And so that's why it's so important that we understand uh, how structure loads are generated and how to safely transfer them. Making sure a structure is all there is just as important as making sure that it's strong enough. So, you know, a lot of times on a job, a uh, building inspector will go out and uh, it's missing, the, the, the structure is missing some important connections. And he may say, well, I can't pass the structure because it's missing these connections. And the, the builder might say, well, hey, I, I've got all this additional shear wall here. You know, why won't you pass it? And, and the reason being is because just because you've provided a stronger part of a connection in one place doesn't make up for something that's missing in another place. And we're going to see that, we're going to see real world examples of that uh, during these trainings of, of how that comes into play. Okay, uh, another important concept when we talk about structures is thinking in three dimensions. A lot of times on plans, uh, usually on plans, you see details that are drawn in two dimensions, like what I'm showing here. And uh, although this detail does illustrate the connections for all three dimensions, it's drawn in two dimensions. And so you kind of have to, as a designer, as a builder or an inspector, 
you have to kind of think about the detail and visualize it in three dimensions. So what I've done is I've taken this specific uh, detail example and I've gone ahead and I've drawn a three-dimensional representation of that same detail. And you can see the different types of forces being transferred. Vertical forces, shear forces acting in one direction, and then shear forces acting in another direction. And you can, you can see by the different colors how those forces are transferred. Shear force from the roof transfers through the blocking, through the nailing into the plywood, then down into the sill plate, and then down and through the beam. Okay, All those same connections are detailed on this detail, but being able to visualize it in three dimensions makes, it, makes your job a lot easier and, and gives you a better understanding for why everything's there. And it also lets you see that structural chain, the load path from, from the start to finish. Now, uh, like I mentioned a moment ago, we're going to be talking about a typical house in Santa Clarita as our example for the training. And we're going to use that example and refer back to it again and again in, 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 the, in these videos uh, to make these requirements real and, and, and to uh, give us a practical application. So just real quick, if you look, uh, 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 if you're uh, following this video, uh, on, our, on the city's website there will be a presentation uh, available for you to follow along with the video. And so if you haven't already opened that or noticed that, you might want to stop the video and open that now so you can follow along. Uh, and you can, you can see the slides along with the video and help you follow some of the details. Uh, you'll notice that there's an uh, example house that's provided. And here's the criteria for our example house. It's a 2,000 square foot home with a tile roof and stucco, very common in Santa Clarita. Um, it's located with, uh, in an area where the seismic forces are about what they are on average here in the city. Okay, Seismic is going to control the design like it, it usually does in the city, control the design. And for this training, we are only going to be talking about uh, forces acting in the transverse direction, this direction. We're not going to be talking about forces in this direction, only in the transverse direction. You'll also notice uh, a plan, uh, plans for our uh, example home. Okay, so starting up here at the roof plan, you'll see we've got a conventional framed roof. Uh, you know, conventional meaning framed with two bys, and we're going to talk more in detail later about what that means and exactly how the roof works. But here's our roof framing plan. You notice we've got all of our detail references and so on. We've got a, uh, a second floor framing plan, which shows the floor framed with uh, TJI joists or wood eye joists. We're going to talk a little bit more about those in a moment. And then uh, we've got our foundation plan. Okay, typical uh, framing plans that you'd expect for any uh, two-story home, all right? Okay, let's talk about the structural parts of our typical house in Santa Clarita. So for our roof and our ceiling joists, we're using 2x8 uh, Doug fir framing, okay? And you can see that that can easily support a roof up to about a 16-foot span, can support ceilings up to 23 feet. Uh, for our floors, we're using wood eye joists. It's really uncommon nowadays anymore to see floors framed with two bys, especially for track construction. Most floors are framed with eye joists. And uh, you could easily support a floor about 20 foot or even up to maybe 25, 26 feet, depending on the size of the joist. Okay. Uh, we also have uh, sawn lumber beams that are going to be part of our home. We're going to talk about beams in detail in part two of the training. Uh, these sawn lumber beams are uh, used for sh usually shorter spans, headers, and things like that, roof beams. And then lastly, uh, we've got glue lamb or paralam beams, or what I like to call manufactured lumber uh, beams. Now, something important to notice about these types of beams is notice the stresses. Normally in a beam, the bending stress is what governs the design of the beam. And for a sawn lumber beam, the bending stress is usually around 1,000 pounds per square inch. Now let's jump down to our manufactured beams, glue laminated and paralam beams. Uh, notice the bending stress in those beams can range from 2,400 to as high as 2,900 PSI. Uh, so something good to commit to memory. When you, when you see an engineered lumber beam or manufactured beam, you're dealing with a, a beam that has 250 to almost 300 percent higher capacity than sawn lumber beams. Uh, and sometimes intuitively it doesn't seem that way. You see a wood beam, you see another wood beam, 
you don't realize that the, force, the, the allowable forces on those beams are actually 250 or 300 times greater. Okay, we've also, of course, got vertical framing members in our house, wood wall studs for a fully braced stud. In a typical wall framing condition, you can put about 2,000 pounds on there. As wall studs get taller, 10 feet or, or more, 2x4 studs are no longer acceptable. You've got to move to 2x6 or double studs. Uh, and then also we're, we're going to find a, uh, posts in our house, wood posts to support heavier loads. 4x4 four four posts, you can uh, put about 7,000, 7,500 pounds. And then uh, as posts get larger, 4x6 four posts, uh, you can start putting uh, much greater loads, 4x6 six and 6x6, six six, you start talking you know, 12,000 to as much as 20,000 pounds on a 6x6 six six, uh, post. Okay, uh, the next topic is uh, nailing for wood frame construction. The building code has certain minimum nailing that all structures have to comply with. And that's what I've depicted here on these details is that minimum nailing and what that nailing really does. And so you'll see here, uh, looking at our, at our roof uh, nailing uh, detail, you've got toe nailing here, three eight penny toenails at a rafter, and then here at the block you've got eight penny toenails at six inches on center uh, in the blocking. And, and I've shown with arrows what those nails do, what forces they resist. You know, your, your standard nailing uh, from a rafter is going to support uh, the wall, tie the wall to the rafter, and also support the vertical loads, any wind uplift loads or other forces that might pull on that rafter. Okay, and uh, I've also included some uh, forces for, for different types of nails, different types of common nails. So you've got a uh, typical eight penny nail, you can put about 100 pounds on there, you go up to the heavier nails, the, the three and a half inch uh, 16 penny nails, you can put about 140 pounds. And it's good to commit these numbers to memory because uh, when designing connections or um, you know, sizing structural elements, you want to have a feeling for what kind of forces you can put on those connections. Now, uh, one other thing I'd like to mention about nailing is the use of nail in withdraw or pullout is not approved for uh, most types of structural forces. For sheathing or something like that, it's okay. But for real structural connections, like a, uh, a beam or a, or, a, or a ledger, you do not use nails in withdraw uh, to support those loads. Okay, and then um, kind of rounding out the components of our house, um, we've got framing clips. These are very common. Um, to tie different structural elements. Uh, they're metal clips. Uh, there's a bunch of different manufacturers. I've gone ahead and just selected uh, one manufacturer here, but uh, there's a bunch of different manufacturers that make these types of connections. And these framing clips, the capacity ranges between somewhere about 450 and, and 650, uh, 650 pounds, okay? Uh, anchor bolts, for a, a typical uh, two by sill with a 5 eighths bolt, you get about 1,400, 1,500 pounds, 1,450 pounds uh, for an anchor bolt. Now, uh, again, good to remember. If, you, you know, if you've got a, a 5 8 inch bolt, you've got about a 1,500 pound capacity. So if you see a shear wall that has a 500 pound per foot capacity, you're expecting to see anchor bolts at three feet on center, uh, you know, at most, right? And uh, uh, that's, it's a good thing to remember. Uh, this is, you know, again, this is, these are the kind of rules of thumb that our inspectors use in the field uh, when, when performing building inspections. Okay, next we've got our vertical straps. You're going to see these later in the training when we talk about seismic forces to tie these shear walls from the second floor to the first floor. And you can see these are very common in residential construction. The one I've selected here is a steel strap that supports about a, uh, almost a 5,000 pound load. And then lastly, we've got hold downs. Uh, these are, these kind of do almost, you know, the same job as a strap, but instead of at a second floor, you're at a foundation, and it supports any seismic uplift forces on shear walls and transfers them to the foundation. Okay. Now, in some of the local uh, areas around Santa Clarita, you know, we're in uh, L.A. County, and um, in the city of L.A. And, and county of L.A., they reduce hold down values by 25%. Here in Santa Clarita, we do not have such an amendment. We allow you to use uh, full values for your hold downs. 
Okay, uh, another piece of hardware that has gained some popularity in recent years is the uh, light gauge field bent sill plate connectors. Um, and uh, these types of connectors, uh, unfortunately, have shown poor installation performance in the field. And I've included here some photos, uh, some reference photos illustrating just that. Um, as you'll notice, uh, a lot of times these connectors don't fit up properly. There's, there's uh, gaps uh, between the nails or between the, the plate and the, um, and the uh, metal connector and the nails don't quite make uh, full contact. Uh, here's another example of the nailing falls in between the studs. And uh, again here, uh, the, the bent plate does not align with the stud. Now, when, when these connectors are installed this way, they don't, they don't have as much capacity as they should and will not perform. So uh, the city uh, has actually, as, as a code amendment, prohibited these connectors for seismic applications. All right, Given what we're seeing in the field, uh, we're not going to allow these for seismic applications. One other thing that if you're going to use these connectors for non-seismic applications that you should be aware of is the bottom edge of this sill connector is exposed. Even once the wall sheathing goes on and everything is put in place, even once you put a weep screed on there, if it's a stucco home, that metal is still exposed to corrosion. And there's only a galvanizing on there uh, on, the, on these connectors. And so, you know, uh, it's debatable, you know, whether or not that corrosion over, over a, a long period of time, whether that connector uh, is, is going to be uh, corroded away or not. And so, um, you know, frankly, on a personal level, I really don't like these connectors. Uh, uh, we do allow them for non-seismic uh, uh, installations, but they are prohibited for seismic installations. Now, uh, if you were to install these connectors, uh, and, and uh, like they do in many cases, they end up like this, then you need, a, you need to have a field fix. And so that's what I'm showing here is uh, a, a epoxy bolt that's been added to make up for the fact that this connector uh, is not going to perform. And so the builder had to go back in, drill a hole, and install a real anchor bolt with epoxy uh, to tie that wall to the foundation. All right. Uh, now that concludes the, the first part of our uh, structural training. And uh, we're going to move on to part two in a moment. We're going to talk about uh, beams and shear walls. So we'll see you there.